Hi, this is Dave Spector with another episode of Blues and Beyond, and today I'm really glad to have as my special guest one of my favorite blues men in the world, a great guitar player and singer, Mr. Steve Freund. Welcome, Thank Steve. You. Thank you. Thank All you. right. Steve, you've got uh, quite an interesting story to tell and how you got into the blues. You're originally from New York. You lived in Chicago for a lot of years, played with people like Coco Taylor, Otis Rush, Sonny Land Slim, Luther Allison. Um, and then you moved out west. You're currently living out west, and uh, mm -hmm. we miss you in Chicago, man. Oh, man. Well, I miss Chicago, too. And I know I've read a lot about and heard a lot about how you uh, came up on the blues scene in New York and, and who you first heard that turned you on to the blues. Could you tell us a little about that? Well, when I was really young, the popular music of the day was actually um, a combination of rock and roll and blues. We had people like Chuck Berry, Fats Domino, and um, Little Richard on the radio. That was that was AM AM radio. And um, on TV, you could see people like uh, Louis Louis Armstrong, and mm -hmm. Jack Teagarden, and um, um, just Benny Goodman. And these were, these this was everyday life for us kids, and we didn't realize where the roots were. We just knew it was it was it was good music. It made you hop around and stuff. And and then um, in the '60s, I got into um, soul music. Mm -hmm. Motown and James Brown and things like that. And slowly I was able to put it all together that, you know, this is an African-American art form that had its roots basically in New Orleans and Chicago. And as, as I became a teenager and the Rolling Stones came out and, um, and then later uh, people like John Mayall and Clapton and um, Led Zeppelin all came out with B.B. King at the same time doing shows together. And I put it all together then mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I was hooked on it at that point. Were you going to shows at places like the Fillmore? Oh, many times, many times. I, I never missed Sonny Terry Brown and McGee show. I uh -huh. never missed Lightning Hopkins. Wow. Um, so BB King several times. I met and, and saw many times Albert and Freddie King. Saw T-Bone Walker at the Fillmore. Wow. I met Otis Spann. Met Met Muddy. Met Willie Dixon. All All before I was even old enough to vote. I mean, it's only 16, 17. So you could get into places like the Fillmore. Yeah. These were, tell, I mean, I, I know about the Fillmore East. There's the Fillmore, the Fillmore East. California, and the Fillmore East were the famous All Almond Brothers records. I was getting recorded. into the Fillmore East um, when I was 16, around late 1968. Uh -huh. In 1969, we were going almost every week. 1970, 71, we were just only you know, we go to blue shows. There were shows at Hunter College. Mm -hmm. There were shows in uh, nightclubs. Uh, when I was 18, I could get in easily. Um, there were shows at Central Park, had great yeah. shows. In fact, I saw B.B. King open for Led Zeppelin at Central Park, and I went to see B.B., but I did enjoy Led Zeppelin. I, yeah. I, you know, I did it, they were good, and the crowd was mostly for Led Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. And B.B. came out and did a set, and they basically booed him off the stage. Mm -hmm. And what I remember was so cool was uh, Robert Plant, who at the time had broken his, his leg, and he was in a full leg hip cast. Mm -hmm. He came out with Jimmy Page, he leaned on Jimmy Page, and, and he, um, he, uh, he chastised the audience and said, you know, without B.B. King, there's no Led Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. So you better get it together. And they brought him back out and he yeah. did a whole set. It was, it was much nicer. That's great. Yeah. So who was the first electric blues guitar player you heard live who really, like, mm -hmm. struck you and moved you as being, you know, powerful? Well, I, I, I think I saw Lightning Hopkins very early on in my life, but... Um, um, I think the first guy really just made made me just really want to be a blues guitar was probably Albert King. Yeah. Yeah, because his simple style was so much like a human voice that I could I could relate to it, and his notes were almost like English words to me. I could mm -hmm. understand the words, and BB King as well. BB was as much was much more, and still is more elegant and jazz inflected. Mm -hmm. Albert was straight country blues played on yeah. electric guitar, and it was just Right to you. Yeah. Right to you, man. So you were seeing these guys when you were 16, 17, 18. Were you already playing by then? Started to play. Um, I had borrowed a guitar. I rented a guitar. Really hard to play arched up guitar from my local store when I was 16. And I tried to play House of the Rising Sun. And um, I kept it out for like two or three months. And my fingers were really raw and bleeding. And yeah. I was also into playing basketball at that time. And um, I gave the guitar back played basketball and hung out, with, went fishing and stuff. And then when I was 17, I, then I made the decision to really go for it. And I mm -hmm. bought a guitar mm -hmm. and I started playing blues. What'd you buy? 
I wanted to be a bass player first. Uh -huh. And I wanted to, because um, I was digging uh, Harvey Brooks, the bass sure. player. He was playing with the Electric Flag. And there was, um, a, third, there was a, a Sam Ash music store by my house. And they had um, a bass there. It was a red Japanese bass, a solid body bass for 30 bucks. Yeah. Now I had a job as a busboy right around the corner. And it took me quite a while to save up 30 bucks. But when I did, I went back to buy it. It was gone. But right next to it was the exact same make and model, except in a six-string version, for mm -hmm. 30 bucks. So I bought it, and I, I figured, well, I'll learn the bass lines on this cheesy little guitar, and then I'll go get a bass later. But I, I just stuck with guitar. And I just no name brand. It was yeah. just, Then I had a Fender Mustang, mm -hmm. which had no frets on it. I didn't know what that meant, but it had <laughs> no frets. And I was wondering why I couldn't play it and why I couldn't tune it. So after that, I started getting good guitars. Like mm -hmm. I got a Fender. Um, I had a, actually a Fender Esquire, mm -hmm. an old Esquire, which I traded for a Les Paul Goldtop, which I traded for my Epiphone Riviera, mm -hmm. which I still have. Yeah, yeah. Seen you, seen you with that guitar mm -hmm. many times. Yeah, that was the main guitar. <clears throat> so Steve, I know a real important show in your life was uh, as a teenager in New York. You went and you heard Willie Dixon's All Stars with Otis Spann, S. P. Leary, Sonny Land Slim. And you got to meet Sunnyland and a number of the other musicians, and, and Sunnyland invited you to come to Chicago? Yes, he did. Otis Spann and S.P. Leary opened up the show at the Electric, the Electric Circus in, 19, in June of 1969. Mm -hmm. And then the, the big band uh, that followed the um, played after was uh, Willie Dixon's Blues All Stars. Mm -hmm. So it was Willie Dixon, Johnny Shines on guitar, Clifton James on drum, Big Walter Horton on harp. Mm -hmm and um, Sonny Land on piano and vocals. And that was the night that I, I went backstage and met everybody. Okay. It was like an open door policy. They let all yeah. the kids come in and hang out. We were just smoking and drinking and Sonny Land gave me his business card and said, you know, when you come to Chicago, look me up. And seven years later, I, I did exactly that. I came out with um, a little pig nose amplifier and that Epiphone Riviera guitar and I, I um, went to the first gig of his that I could, which was right here on North Lincoln Avenue called Elsewhere on Lincoln, mm -hmm. Lincoln and Grace. Mm -hmm. and that was a great club. It was, um, man, it actually had sawdust on the floor, no cover, they passed a hat. Every night was a legendary musician. Sunny Lane had one night, I'm not sure if it was Wednesday or Thursday. Yeah. And then, you know, you, you wouldn't believe the people who would be in there. I mean, you know, yeah. just walk in there, Willie Maybon could be in there, Brownie McGee would be in there. Floyd Jones, the Myers Brothers, Sonny Land, Little Brother Montgomery, anybody would walk in there, Willie yeah. Dixon, and you just, just would be amongst royalty. And the thing about it, they treated me so well, I just kept coming back. Yeah. So for our, our viewers out there who aren't familiar with a lot of these names, especially Sonny Land Slim, who you, you know, had a long working relationship, or almost like a son to him. Could you tell us a little, a little bit about Sonny Land and his place in Chicago Blues history? Sonny Land Slim was born in Vance, Mississippi in 1907. And he ran away from home when he was 12 because he had a, his stepmother was, uh, I guess, abusive or whatever. He ran away and he hung out in Memphis, Tennessee for a while with um, Memphis Slim, another piano player. And uh, Memphis Slim's father owned a sort of a bordello type of a house. And he was a big, big time operator down there. And if you ever listen to Memphis Slim, piano and singing style, you'll see that him and Sonny Land had very similar styles. Long story short though, Sonny Land eventually made his way down to Chicago and he was a very powerful singer. And he started out as being valet to a man named Dr. Clayton, who was a, a doctor, an actual doctor, who lost his family in a house fire. Mm -hmm. And he became kind of nutty and he, gave up medicine and he became a blues singer and the legend says he used to walk around the streets with no shoes on and picking up cigarette butts off the floor and that, that whole thing. And Sonny Land was his valet and his name at the time, Sonny Land called himself Dr. Clayton's Buddy. So his earliest recordings are his Dr. Clayton's Buddy. And then he developed his own piano style. And his first recordings were him singing only because he wasn't in the union. Mm -hmm. So he had Blind John Davis mm -hmm. play behind him. And he became quite a, a unique piano player and singer and wrote some very great songs. And he, big, big voice. His, the claim to fame that most guys give Sonny Lane is that he introduced Muddy Waters to Leonard Chess. Mm -hmm. And 
started that whole Muddy Waters thing. So right. it's a, to me, he was just a great blues singer and a great piano player. And I learned a lot uh, about life off of Sonny. Yeah. And can you talk about some of the uh, the guitar players you played with, played behind people like Otis Rush and Luther Allison? Well, the first guys I played with when I first came here to Chicago in 76 was um, Hubert Sumlin, mm -hmm. who I'll be playing with um, in the next day or two. Uh, Hubert, uh, Helen Wolf had just died, and I started hanging out with Hubert Sumlin. And from Hubert, I um, started hanging out with a guy named Hip Linkchain, who was another guy. He was a contemporary of Magic Sam. And then slowly I um, met Lewis Myers and Jimmy Johnson. And Homesick James was an early um, influence on me. And they all were so nice to me. And you know, I never really like took lessons, but I was out every single night, and I was able to glean a lot of different styles. I later eventually met Otis and played with Otis Rush. Mm -hmm. In 1979, Luther Allison heard about me and came down to where I, where I was playing with Big Walter Horton, and he took me on a 10-week tour of Europe. So that was a big thing. I learned a lot with Luther. Mm -hmm. Lee Jackson was a man who taught me a lot on rhythm guitar. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I played with so many great people, and yeah. you know Robert Lockwood included. And right. You've also backed up a lot of great harmonica players. You mentioned Big played, Walter, of course. Oh, yeah. Can you talk about the guitarist's role in Chicago blues and other styles of blues, backing up harp players, backing up harmonica? Well, there's two different kinds of schools. Well, there's several schools of guitar for blues. Um, I think the, the, the one that is the most influential in a, as a backup role would be Robert Lockwood Jr. Mm -hmm. uh, he could play finger picking in the Mississippi Delta tradition, but he could also play jazz. He knew all the jazz chords, and he was very influential. He's, he's on mostly all the really big hits of um, Little Walter. Mm -hmm. and he's playing all those cool sixths and ninths yeah. and sliding chords and very rhythmic patterns. And Lewis Myers would be on there, a lot of that too, mm -hmm. and playing the bottom part. And Lewis, in his own right, was a great jazz inflected guitar player. Right. Um, that's one school. That's the, the backing of the harp school. Then there's the backing of the piano school, mm -hmm. which is different, because there's different holes and pockets to fill. Um, in that school, um, I personally like, um, I, I enjoy, very much enjoyed Matt Murphy's early work mm -hmm. with Memphis Slim. And um, I always thought Big Bill Bruns, he played a, a great role in that, because he always... Even if he was singing, he was always had great piano players, and he mm -hmm. played great stuff behind them. So that's another guy. Um, there's also a Memphis Mini School of Guitar, too, which mm -hmm. is a finger-picking, electrified Delta-style guitar. Right. And then there's a Muddy Water style, which is slide guitar, right. heavy slide guitar, powerfully slide guitar. Um, and then there's the Tampa Red School, right. which is an earlier pre-war. So yeah. we really basically divide into pre-war and post-war blues. Yeah. But most people don't realize the original Chicago blues came from New Orleans. When they came up the river in the 20s, they came to Chicago for work, and a lot of them stayed. The little brother Montgomery would be a very prominent figure in that as a piano player. Louis Armstrong came and lived here for several years. Mm -hmm. uh, Jack Teagarden, the trombone player as well. So there was a whole, what you call a traditional New Orleans jazz sound here mm -hmm. before the Delta Blues became very popular before the Mississippi style did. What we play is mm -hmm. an outgrowth of the Mississippi style. Mm -hmm. And then the way, we, the way you're taking it now is a sophisticated, uh, jazzy approach would be more of a East Coast, West Coast mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. and, and so in that, I would say that's a Midwest thing still because Charlie Christian actually started that. Right. And he started, I believe, in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. So it all we're all like on branches of a huge yeah. tree, you know. Every, and there's new growths every day. Yeah, it's a great way to put it.